I'm Sarah Jaffe. I'm a professor of psychology in the psychology department at the University of Pennsylvania. And my students and I are interested in how experiences across the life course, and particularly experiences of adversity, shape development. Um, my background's in developmental psychology with an interest in developmental psychopathology. And so we are interested in um, really two kinds of questions within that framework. We're interested in how the experiences um, that children and you know, adolescents and adults have become biologically embedded, so how they shape physiological development and how they um, shape our underlying biology, basically. And we're also interested in how um, what a child brings into the world shapes how they respond to the experiences that they encounter. And so how, for example, a child's temperament might shape how that child responds to experiences of adversity um, and how two children with very different temperaments might respond really, really differently to exactly the same experience. And so we, um, we work on these kinds of questions in the lab. Um, one study that we've done over the last four or five years involved um, 400 children and their families in the United Kingdom. And we were interested in how children's experiences of harsh and non-supportive parenting in early childhood shape their physiological development and their behavioral development in middle childhood. And we were particularly interested in how children's genetic makeup and, and then also the experiences that they had subsequent to early childhood might modify that association. So one of the things we found, for instance, was that um, children who have a particular genotype um, are at particularly high risk for symptoms of depression and anxiety when they encounter lots of adverse experiences across, across early and into middle childhood. And, and that's something that lots of other people have found, but we were interested in looking a little further to try and understand why children with that combination of genetic and environmental risks would be particularly vulnerable. And so we focused on children's coping. Um, so when you ask children about how they cope with stressful situations, they might tell you that they, um, they find a, an adult or they find a friend and they talk about their problems and they get support, or they might tell you that they actively look for solutions to the problem, or they might tell you that they just try and pretend the problem's not happening, they just try to avoid it. Um, or they might tell you that they um, do positive things to distract themselves so that they don't think too much about the problem. They, they read a book or they play basketball or they do something like that. And what we found is that children with this um, particular combination of um, genetic risk factors and lots of adverse experiences across childhood uh, were less frequently endorsing these kinds of distraction coping strategies. So they were less frequently saying that when they felt stressed out and when they had a problem, they would play sports or they would watch a movie or they would do something like that to distract themselves. And that was part of the reason that they were at elevated risk for depression and, and anxiety symptoms. You know, a, a lot of my research is collaborative mm -hmm. because I'm interested in this interplay between social experiences and biology. I really have to collaborate with folks outside of my discipline. And so um, I am really intrigued by the challenge of collaborating with, um, with geneticists, for example, to try and import some of those methods into the social sciences. And, um, you know, there are real tensions between what is cutting edge, for example, in, in genomics and um, the kinds of questions we might want to answer in the social sciences, right? So some methods that um, can tell you everything you want to know about a person's genome and the extent to which um, different genes are methylated or genes are expressed um, are incredibly informative and incredibly costly, right? You know, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to assay per participant. And, and for those of us who are interested in representative sampling and, and taking a more epidemiological approach, trying to reconcile those methods and, and, and the methods that we use in epidemiology is, is really difficult, but, but I, I enjoy the challenge of it.